hello, Ken, and thank you for joining me for my first Ripple Maker interview podcast, where we're going to be exploring your entrepreneurial teaching journey. So this one is my prototype practice version. So I'm doing it with you because <laughs> it's the safest way to start, um, which I think is good whenever you're trying something new to, to do it in a way that feels safe so that you can kind of learn and grow and, and dip your toes into it. Um, so you already have a preview of what we're going to be talking about. And I will say, uh, like I have mentioned before on my podcast, it's all unedited and unscripted. Uh, what is kind of fun today is we've had some pretty crazy weather out here. So I'm hoping that the connection is going to hold. Okay. <laughs> so if there's any glitches in the audio for anyone, I apologize. Um, that's something that, you know, as this grows down the road, I'll start thinking about all of the fancy stuff. But right now, I just want to talk to awesome people like you. So I, I did not prep an introduction for you because I am way too close to it. We have been working together for years. So to start us off as best you can, how how did you end up here? <laughs> it's like, take us back <laughs> kind of to the beginning. So it's framed around your entrepreneurial teaching journey. But, uh, but take us back to the beginning and, and kind of walk us through how you ended up to where you're at today as an entrepreneurial teacher. Uh, okay. Well, <laughs> so I guess to frame it, I was, uh, you know, I think like a lot of people who end up being entrepreneurs, I, I had some decent brain power. I was intelligent in certain ways and definitely a little neuro spicy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so so you know so i i i made friends was you know social but also didn't really you know like i could do okay in school but didn't really connect to it um you know liked sports but wasn't really very good at it at first and and just you know i got kind of picked on all that kind of stuff i mean i was the book nook king you know love <laughs> so i lo loved reading and you know so it was just but I don't think it was anything uh, atypical. Um, and, and basically what happened is as I moved through kind of high school and into college, I just really loved teaching. And, and I think what I loved about teaching was helping people like expand the possibilities of who they were. So, and even, you know, kind of as a kid, I mean, I taught swim lessons, I would babysit and, you know, and I wasn't a, uh, sit on the couch type babysitter. I would just create games and have fun. I just liked seeing people light up. So I think that that was kind of always there. And I meandered my way through uh, a couple years of college, not really connecting to why I was there, you know, and just, I would, I would get lazy. I wouldn't do the work or it, it just didn't connect. So, so I basically fell into a martial arts school and really mainly because I'd always had an interest in Eastern philosophy. Um, I loved moving my body uh, and, you know, being in the military, I thought fighting would be cool. Um, so, so it's just kind of ended up there and, and, and that really started it because I, you know, I loved it for myself, but right from the beginning, I found myself getting a little bit of trouble sometimes because I'd, I'd help people who, I was a beginner just like them, but they're stuck. And I just volunteer to kind of help, you know, them if they weren't remembering moves. And then the instructor would tell me to shut up and <laughs> let him do his job, you know, that kind of thing. So um, then what ended up happening, now you remember this is in like the early 90s. So this goes way back. And there was this shift in martial arts away from it being kind of this backyard basement type thing to for mainly crazy male adults, you know, like like me to children you had karate kid came out and then teenage mutant ninja turtles just blew everything up and then you had the power rangers after that so i just come in early for a class and there were a bunch of kids doing karate and i just walked i i remember just i'm getting goosebumps right now even remembering it just seeing all of these red faced enthusiastically flailing yelling children and I'm like, this is amazing. Like they're, they don't, they're not static. They're not sitting at desks, passively getting information punched into their heads and figuring out how to regurgitate it. They're like, you know, 
<laughs> Sorry, that's kind of my uh, my view on traditional education back then. Also kind of a funny pun, getting yes. punched into their heads <laughs> while we're doing karate. <laughs> <laughs> See, that was not even intentional, but yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so anyway, so I just fell in love with the idea of that that model like the freedom to just be movement based and active and empowering and you know so i started teaching and i asked to be an instructor and you know they kind of begrudgingly decided to let me do it and you know just and i just fell in love with it and i loved the idea of um just having students for decades you know just i didn't know if that was possible but i knew that if you're in a traditional school system you get them for nine months and then they go on and live their lives I liked the idea of being there through the arc of their life and, you know, learning about them and how they evolve. And then I evolve and we all, you know, evolve together. So, uh, so fast forward, I ended up uh, taking over a school that was struggling and wasn't even a black belt yet, had no idea how to run a business, had really very limited martial arts knowledge, but I knew how to teach. And uh, they gave me a few months to kind of get it, you know, headed in the right direction, which I did. Um, eventually grew that school, you know, into where we, <laughs> you remember 200 students in 800 square feet where there were days we couldn't even kick because there wasn't room. And, uh, you know, it was owned by a couple of partners who I eventually bought out and then we expanded and, uh, and that began the journey was really just looking at the martial arts as this, this kind of vehicle for positively impacting communities, being an ally for families, being a resource to those communities, and most importantly, being in an educational facility. Um, and from there, all the other projects that we can talk through really just geared around the idea of empowering people to be an incredible, resourceful, problem-solving teacher in their own way. And all the people that ended up helping and assisting at the school that we hired through the years were very improbable martial arts teachers, but <laughs> you know, they weren't, they, none of us fit the prototype of what that would be or the stereotype of what that would be, but we all were good humans who wanted to help other humans be good humans. And that led into, that's just carried through Questor's Way, through the Integrated Entrepreneur Program, all that kind of stuff. Excellent. You make my job easy. <laughs> so I do have a I do have a question for you off of all of that. Um, so when we talk about being an entrepreneurial teacher, you can be entrepreneurial without actually being an entrepreneur. You can also be a business owner without being entrepreneurial. <laughs> a lot of people just own a job. They're just, you know, they go to work every day as if they worked for someone else. They just also have the task of doing all the administrative stuff. So what made you decide to to carve your own path? What made you decide to make that leap from being entrepreneurial under someone else to being willing to be an entrepreneur? And I know I know a lot of the backstory. Um, so we'll focus more on the, the side of just like what what do you love about being a business owner yourself? So it, it's an interesting thing and I think about this a lot. And I think that part of it. So an entrepreneurial minded person, they, they recognize that are problems and they want to be part of solving them. And they're not satisfied with the solutions that are currently available. And it's what makes them obnoxious because, <laughs> because, because you're someone else is saying, you know, if you're working like in someone else's business and you're entrepreneurial minded, you're looking around and saying, hey, there's a better way, you know, but then other people who don't think that way are like, no, we do it this way. But if you're entrepreneurial minded, that's very frustrating. And, you know, and that's kind of what happened to me is I recognized that the only way I could really do the things that I wanted to do to make it successful was I had to be my own boss. I don't do well when I'm just told what to do from other people and and it doesn't make sense to me, you know, and even if I'm wrong, I'm okay. That's the other thing is I think that entrepreneurially minded people are uh, less risk averse. So they're willing to, to try things. They're willing to fall on their face. They're willing to, you know, like I, at one point in my business arc, everything I own fit in the back of a Ford Escort, 
you know, and I had to stay with friends and it was okay because it was, I was willing to take those risks. There are other people that are, there's no way they would ever want to even consider putting themselves in that position. So, so you've got the entrepreneurial part is that it's that, you know, identifying problems and innovating solutions, you know? And so I think that's one of the things that's unique. And then the teacher part is you're not focused on doing this for yourself. You're focused on other people learning in a way where you're part of their growth. And there's a feedback loop where you're seeing their growth. You're seeing your solution work for them. And then that rolls back around. It ripples back towards you. So it creates this loop that you literally get addicted to, where you're just looking around thinking, what other problem can I solve? And that's what happened to us. It's like, you know, oh, we could help kids in school. Well, they're getting good grades, but they still need help go beyond the grades. Let's find out how to do social things. Let's figure out how to help them test better. All that kind of stuff. Martial arts isn't enough. Oh, well, then let's just figure out how to help people teach everything. And that was Quester's way, you know? So yeah, so hopefully that answers the question. I think it does. And and would you say that that we lean a little more to extreme entrepreneurship in terms of the willingness to take risks and be disruptive in the things that we start. Cause you don't have to, you could be an entrepreneur and not take the extreme amount of risk, you know, the startup risk absolutely. that comes with a, a new disruptive business. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that actually a lot of people become very successful entrepreneurially working in other people's businesses when they just have an environment where the culture is willing to accept them putting themselves out there a little bit. It it gives them the space to test some things while at the same time mitigating the risk on their behalf so that they can learn that. And, and I think there's, you know, with every, all, for all of the under 40 people out there, I guess at this point who are really thinking about needing side gigs and trying entrepreneurial things, there's nothing wrong with, cutting your teeth in someone else's business, you know, make a little money, learn some lessons, you know, leverage institutional knowledge and, you know, and realize just how risk averse you are because being a little less risk averse can actually shorten your arc towards a successful venture because you'll be smarter about it. You know, I was kind of dumb. I took too many risks, you know, at times. And if I'd been a little bit more cautious it probably would have made for a smoother path. So yeah, but it's a, it's a spectrum. It's not like you just either are, or you aren't, you know, this isn't an on off switch. It's a dimmer switch. So you got to kind of figure out where you are. Yeah. And there's a lot of paths that you can follow as well. Like we were just talking to someone who has this amazing background and all kinds of consulting, working with large companies and is now in pest control. And to my understanding, I think he owns like a franchise of, so he, it's a piece of someone's larger business. And it was just such a juxtaposition to all of the things that had come before. And I, I asked him how he got there and he just said, it's ridiculously profitable. So there's, <laughs> that's, you know, that's a lower yep. risk if you recognize that you can, you can serve people well. And I mean, he comes at his business from such a wonderful place of, you know, most pest control people show up, spray your stuff, drive away, leave that little stick in the lawn, you know, but this guy has, he has his guys check in with the the homeowner before and after there's a lot of communication and relationships that are being developed. So he's doing it in an entrepreneurial teaching way, but it's, it's just pest control, you know, and, and he's doing yeah. it because it's low risk. People need it. And it's apparently got a very high profit margin. So if someone's looking for some way of, you know, it was, it was interesting. <laughs> got me thinking a little bit, are we in the wrong line of work? <laughs> <laughs> but I think what's interesting about that is it's, you know, that, that kind of, and we can talk about a little bit more, but the whole concept of the integrated entrepreneur is it's about alignment in all the areas of your life. And talking with him, he has fun making money. Like it's, he loves the game. You can feel it. He's been in sales and just, it's like, that's, that's the game. So it would make sense that he would do that because it aligns with who he likes to be and the way that he drives value. 
and solves problems and, you know, and creates solutions and all that kind of stuff. So that's a big part of it, you know? Yeah. And there's, the there's, there's a truth to making a lot of money so that you can give back, you know, because if you're not making any money, there's only so much that you can do for the people around you. There's only so many people you can hire. If anyone, your contributions are limited. If you have limited funds and you're stressed and thinking about money all the time, when you have lots of money, it's, uh, I, I read a book recently that I did talk about on my podcast episodes ago, it was called doing good better. And I forget who it was by. Um, but he talks about this doctor that went through a process while he was in med school of, I could go be like a doctors without borders type person and be boots on the ground, or I could stay home in the UK and make a whole bunch of money. And when he did the math of the contribution that he could make, he realized that he could do more by making a bunch of money, doing it the traditional way, and then giving back to support other people going out and doing the Doctors Without Borders thing. So it's a method of earn to give. And that's th this guy does amazing stuff for the community. He's constantly involved in charitable efforts. So he's earning to give. He knows that if he has a really high profit margin, he can employ more people, he can give a better service, and he can stay dedicated to helping his community. And I mean, we ended up talking to him because we're, we're similar in our contribution first mindset. Yeah, no, and it is it, that it's actually it's kind of interesting because money. So money just represents the potential to energize the system. And, you know, for a lot of entrepreneurs, they struggle with that part of it on either end, either, you know, like, I kind of embraced the starving martial arts, you know, like, I, I felt like I wasn't supposed to make money if I was being true to the service, you know, so there's that end of it. And then there's the other end where, if you don't make enough money, you're not successful. And neither of those things are necessarily true. It's just understanding that revenue generation is, if you're thinking entrepreneurially, whether you're in someone else's business or your own, if, if revenue generation isn't balanced enough, you're going to have a problem, you know? So you work for someone else, you get laid off because there's not enough money. You know, if you're working for yourself, you're not going to have a business very long or you can't grow or you can't, you know, hire help, what, whatever it may be. So, yeah, so you do, it's part of the equation that you really need to consider. You can't, hope is not a plan. <laughs> so you, you need to balance that into the equation, you know? All right, we could talk about this type of topic all day long because it is literally yep. what we do. Uh, but I want to make sure that we dive into the work that you're doing, which is also mm -hmm. the work that I'm doing to some degree. But the way that we complement each other in momentum learning systems is I am kind of the organizer presenter person, and you're really the the connector. Um, you're the the visionary behind a lot of the the stuff that we create. And then as our mentor, John Fritz would always say, I'm the string on the balloon. So there's a, a co-creation, um, but I feel like this, the seeds of germination often come from you. So this latest uh, version of our work that's grown out of the pandemic and the move into the digital is kind of creating a digital, entrepreneurial teaching dojo online because when we really sat down and thought about it that's what we love doing is creating spaces learn and grow together that's what we did with the dojo that's what we did with questers way that's what we did with the gym that we that we helped build the art gallery we helped run everything always came back to spaces where people can learn and grow so now we're just bringing that into the digital space with the on integrated entrepreneur program which has both a a community and a, an academy. Um, but tell us, tell us about that. How did the inter integrated entrepreneur, I don't know why I can't say it today. How did the integrated entrepreneur program come to be? What so, is it? It, yeah, yeah. So it's really, it's really just one more, like it's the expanding expression of something that we've been doing for 30 years, which was let's create a structure that's loose enough that people can be entrepreneurial, 
but also structured enough that they've got some guide rails. They've got some banks to the river so that they can, you know, basically energize themselves with support and we'll see what gets expressed. So that's like the whole drop of pebble maker ripples. The whole idea was, you know, everyone has a contribution and you visualize that as a pebble and you have your contribution, which is unique to you. And what you need to do is feel that you're in an environment that's safe enough that you're willing to release it out into the world. You let it drop, you let it go, you drop it. Now there has to be a point of impact. And if you think of a body of water, it strikes one point of impact and then the ripples spread. So that's all we've ever done. You know, and we've done it through martial arts school, through Questor's Way, gyms, whatever. We just, we, we create an environment where people can flourish by developing skills that allow them to release their contribution out into the world, right? And we're just trying to accelerate that process so they can do it smarter and faster and learn from all the mistakes that, you know, well, that I've made over the years anyway. So, <laughs> so, so one of the things that I noticed though, with a lot of entrepreneurs forget that the journey is the home. So they're thinking that life will be good when I get there. Life will be good when my business is successful or when I have the mansion or the fast car or the spouse or, you know, whatever, you know, there's some goal in mind. It's good to have goals, very powerful, but they're, they're not recognizing the present moment is the only moment you have. And the journey is where the joy should be. So and part of that is they're not, they're being separate. So they have the role they play when they're selling. They have the role they play when they go home and deal with that stuff. They have the role they play with their friends. And those things literally are not integrated. So the more people I've talked to globally, I'm talking to people all over the world over the last like 18 months or so, and they're all saying the same thing. You know, they have this passion, they have this contribution, they want to let go, but there's a disconnect between who they're being and the work that they're doing you know, to varying degrees. Some of them, it's not bad. Others, it's, it's really significant. So what I started recognizing is through all the ups and downs of my entrepreneurial journey, through all the things that I've done, I feel fulfilled. I'm happy. I, I've been me the whole way through. I mean, you've known me forever. Have I ever been anything different than what I say I am? I'm just me, right? So the integrated entrepreneur you know, the academy and the community is about helping people clarify their value so that when they add energy to their contribution, when it accelerates, right, goes to scale, impact, whatever that might be, they're in balance and the system's in balance. And eventually it becomes, it gains so much momentum that it outlives them. It continues beyond them. So that's what we're exploring in this program. And we've just continued to free ourselves from feeling that it matters what industry they're in, what type of person they are, their age, the stage of their life they're in. None of that matters. You know, if you love the idea of solving problems, creating unique solutions, you have a contribution you want to make and you want to be you in every aspect of your life. That's our new dojo. Awesome. That was beautiful. <laughs> and I, I, what I also heard in it and I did I talked about this in my Monday podcast and actually later today I'm giving a speech on it in Toastmasters but just you you walked through that value impact legacy process for yourself to figure out what was going to make sense for the next you know the next step or, or how we could do what we were already doing better in a more cohesive clear way so that more people could be a part of it because the consulting is expensive and there's a lot of beautiful heart like heartfelt entrepreneurial teachers out there that don't have the thousands of dollars that it costs to to hire a consultant to help them you know that's i mean that's the place that we were at a lot of times is we were doing good work but we were following that artist path of doing the work first and, and putting the contribution out there and, and then waiting for it to those seeds to, to grow into something. So that's part of the, the contribution that and legacy that we're looking to create is building something that's, that is going to help other people. And the point of this podcast is not a 
pitch for our program. It just, you know, we just happen to be doing it together. So it's easy for us to, to both talk about it. But I think what's really important for people to, to hear through what you just talked about was you took yourself through a process of what's worked for me in the past. Like what value do I have? What strengths do I have? What fills me up and makes me feel good? You know, and, and what, what's been successful? What have I done before? And, and so you looked at that and you recognized your value. And then it was like, okay, how can I scale this? How can I create an impact with this? And then from there, it expands into the legacy, which is extending beyond just this one program, but how we can, you know, keep it passing on, keep dropping pebbles and making ripples. That taking yourself through that process as an entrepreneurial teacher um, could be really valuable, whatever you end up producing out of it. Yeah. And I think for, you know, for people who are, you know, starting this journey, or maybe they're, they're just, they're, they're thinking they need to reboot, you know, it's, it always starts with that clarification of value. And that, that is an ongoing process. It's not something you, you don't get clear and you're done. You're just, you know, you're pulling back layer after layer and you never get to the center of the Tootsie Pop. It's not going to happen, right? <laughs> so, you know, but you, you need to start there, you know, because otherwise what ends up happening is you start going to the, the scale part, you're going to end up forcing things that don't quite fit you. And, and it may... It may even work to a degree, but you're going to find yourself like disconnected from your own work. So, you know, so you have to be really, really clear. It's like, I remember when we opened our second dojo, the first six months, we had a lot of interesting people who had interesting ideas about what a dojo meant. And, but we were so clear on what a dojo meant to us and who we could best serve that those people kind of got spit out. And after a year, you had a community that worked, you know, and it wouldn't have worked if we weren't clear because we would have gotten pulled in all of these different directions, you know, and we wouldn't have had the value wouldn't have scaled right because we had a blurry picture of value. So always start there, you know, get, get clear and get help getting clear because when you're in your own head, that can be really tricky too. So you, you got to get outside sources that are willing to be truthful with you. And understand that those growing pains are part of the process of developing, even just developing this the space. I mean, we dip our toes into kind of the um, the more esoteric, like woo woo world and and stuff. So you can you can take energy however you want to, but uh, we have relocated our dojo just to you know over. It's been. 25 years. So it's moved a couple of times and every single time for the first year, uh, it was a little longer when we opened our, our satellite location that we had for a little while, but it's like the space needed time to figure itself out. So not only did we get kind of interesting people that didn't quite fit and we had to stay strong in who we were, kids peed on the mats. Like, <laughs> yep. Just like they had to christen the place. It was like the energy or like the vibration or however you want to look at it, like wasn't quite settled yet. And, and it would, after an average of three years in a new space, no problems, no one wetting themselves, no kids peeing on the mat. I mean, we had at the store's location, we had explosive diarrhea. Sorry if anyone's eating while they're listening to this across the entire <laughs> dojo in, in that first you know, couple of years. And then it just all somehow settles down. And I cannot remember the last time that we had a child have an accident. You know, it's just such a funny thing. And it happened every single time, every time we moved, it, it was just, it was so, such a funny phenomenon. So whenever you're building something new, you know, it's going to take a little while, even if you are hyper clear. Well, first of all, if you're hyper clear, I promise you, it's not going to work out the way that you thought it was going to, because this is not where we thought we were going to end up by any means. You know, there is some, some level of this vision, but not, not where it definitely didn't include a pandemic. It, you know, it didn't, it didn't include a lot of things that have a lot of things that have happened. Um, and, and it's just, you know, so you have, you're clear in who you are and then you trust that the universe is going to, you know, align as the more you stay true to what you're doing and you're going to, your people are going to be pulled to you. 
Well, yeah, and you're you're speaking to another really valuable lesson to understand, which is you know you in the entrepreneurial world you you have the ability to be fluid. So you know, so personally, I just think I'm really good at developing and empowering good, well-meaning humans who love to teach and learn. So if you're starting from a core, you know, where that value is, it's it's not like a thing that you produce or even a thing that you teach. It's it's a way that you contribute to the world. You're able to kind of pivot and follow interesting pathways. And the other thing that's funny is feedback is good, even negative. You know, and we just talked about this in Questor's way. I, I liked bad reviews, you know, because it meant that someone cared enough to tell you the truth. <laughs> and and maybe they weren't even telling you the truth. They were telling you their truth. But I mean, you know, getting that level of engagement, the fact that they're willing to take the time, even if they're unhappy, at least they care. So again, when you're going through that value clarification, you may think you figured it out. Now you put yourself out there and you get beat up, get your nose bloodied a little bit. That's not a bad thing. You know, as long as you remember, why am I doing this and what's trying to express itself? you'll be able to flow through that and pivot when necessary and you keep testing. And over time, you just get better. Like John Acuff would say, get the reps in. You know, you're just always getting reps in on this journey. Excellent. All right. So as we start to to move towards a close, because again, we could talk all day long. <laughs> um, I have a, a couple of kind of uh, like closing questions for you. So uh, to start, what's one thing that you would suggest to our listeners that they can apply to their life today? So if you could offer from your field of expertise, something that someone could practice, play with, contemplate today, what would that be if it was only one thing? <laughs> uh, it's, it's just make micro installments in the five practices in service to yourself every day. So, so that's, you know, move every day, something good for your brain, think, learn something, connect, nurture a relationship, both with others and with yourself, nourishment, the, the, the nutrition you put in the sleep, you get that kind of stuff and empower, you know, breathe, meditate, pray, whatever it is for you sit under a tree. It doesn't matter, but don't wait until something goes wrong. And then think that you can, you know, replenish, just build a bank account. And then, especially on the entrepreneurial journey, you have great relationships and something blows up or goes wrong. People will rally around you. If, if you're physically healthy, like I spend a lot of time focusing on vitality and, you know, my, my physical health, because no matter what business comes and goes, people come and go in the end, if you're capable of continuing to drive yourself forwards, you know, you you always have yourself. You are your best resource. So you need to make investments proactively in that every freaking day, even if it's just five minutes. I get a little passionate about that one, but I ca I cannot stress enough how important that part of it is. And as an entrepreneurial teacher, that's the value of building models because I asked you for one thing and you technically gave me five. <laughs> yeah, so move, think, connect, fuel, and empower are the the short little keywords that we use for that model. Um, and yeah. it's definitely, I also obviously do that and it's it's helpful and it can be hard. Move has been challenging as, as we've gotten busier and you know you have to find creative ways to keep those things. So I have an under desk treadmill now and there's plenty of times I'm in meetings and I'm bobbing up and down on the Zoom because I'm walking on my, my treadmill to make sure I'm getting some kind of physical activity and not ending up, you know, stuck at my desk, hunched over all day long. Mm -hmm. So, all right. So next one, uh, what, uh, I can read. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hold on. All right. Oh, uh, so what, what should people look for in, uh, in someone who does the type of work that you do? So, I mean, if you were to put this into like layman's internet terms, or we're, we're business consultants, you know, we help entrepreneurs, figure out how to uh, organize and elevate their, their business. Um, and a lot of people do that in a lot of different ways, but in general, we are a business consultant. So what would, what should someone look for when they're looking to hire a business consultant? 
Can I give you two things for this one? Yeah, you can. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the first one is you want someone who's more interested in asking questions than giving you answers. If they have some kind of proven thing and no matter what you say, they tell you how you just need to do what they tell you to do, I, I would I would look a little closer at whether they're really going to be a good fit for you. So, and sometimes there are great systems that really do require implementation, but if they're not, if they're not asking questions, if they're not curious about how they can get what they know to work for you, if they just keep telling you, if it's not working, it's you, it's not them. That's a warning sign. So that would be the first thing. And the other thing, I've been thinking about this a lot just with just the way our world is right now. Um, you see this in fitness and nutrition a lot. The, the Have a higher degree of skepticism, skepticism based on, did I say that right? Skepticism. <laughs> That's like a yeah. funny word, yeah. <laughs> That's so, sometimes your tongue just gets on the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. So based on the, the intensity of the emotions they're evoking, so if they're telling you that, you know, if they're getting, making you afraid, if they're warning you that the whole world's going to blow up, you're something bad's going to happen, or they're selling you this, you know, incredible, unrealistic level of hope, right? If they're pushing at the edges of emotions, you've got to wonder what their motive is, right? So the, the, the wisest people I know kind of modulate in the center. And they dance with the edges, but they don't live there, you know? So they're like, yeah, you know, bad things happen, you know, but they're not, they're not like, oh my God, a bad thing will happen to you if you don't take this pill right now or do my program right now, if you ever want to be happy, you know? So just pay attention to that, especially in their marketing. If they, if they feel like they're either selling you the stars or they're scaring you into hiding in a cave, I would question whether I would look very closely before working with someone like that. I, there is, whenever I talk to a, a consultant or a service provider or whatever, and, you know, we go through that little call and I, realistically, this has happened to me twice, but both times it made me wish that I could work with them. When they go through their discovery process, they ask you the questions and then they get through it and, and they say, you know what? I don't think we're a good fit. I don't think I'm the right yeah. person to work with you. And I, it, nothing makes me want to work with that person more because I, they're telling me the truth, you know, and, and it's, I appreciate so much when there's that genuine, you know, like they're obviously not just trying to, if we teach components of that, you know, in the martial yeah. arts, like back in the day, yeah. that's what you guys were all taught to say. If anyone asks, do you do jujitsu or do you do kung fu or, you know, whatever you just say, Oh, we teach yeah. components of that, you know, and it was just to, to make sure you got the sale, you know, and that's, that's disingenuous. That's manipulative. So when, mm -hmm. when someone's being true and you can feel that they have something they believe in, they know it works for certain people because nothing works for everyone, you know, and they're willing to stay true to that, that nothing sells me more than someone that's being authentic and real like that. Yeah. And I, I think that that's really the key. You know, the, the best consultants out there, they're curious and they're genuinely excited for you. They're not excited about what they know or, or what their service is. They're excited for the change that can, that you can make with their help, you know, and there's a lot of great ones out there. It's just, it's a little noisy right now. So you have to do a little bit of work to sort it through and make sure that, you know, there's great marketers. And then there are great teachers and, you know, often great teachers aren't the best marketers. So they're a little quieter, you know, and they're, they're not going to shout for your attention. So you've got to kind of look past all the noise of people telling you how wonderful what they have is. It may be, but you just got to use a lot of discernment. It's, it's tricky. <laughs> yeah. And usually if someone says I can flip a switch and solve all your problems, they're full of. BS. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nothing, nothing's that easy, unfortunately, but the internet likes to try to tell us 
that it is. Mm -hmm. All right, rapid fire questions for the end. Uh, what's one lesson you've learned that you would pass on to others in your field? Uh, now, hold on. I feel like I need to clarify rapid fire for you. Rapid fire means you get to give me a one sentence answer. So this one has to be <laughs> quick, which I know it's hard for you. So if you had come up with one like quick little thing that you would pass on to others in in your field of business consulting, um, what would it be? Uh, learn to keep asking bigger and better questions until the questions disappear and the answer is revealed. Perfect. All right. And uh, what's a, a, just a lesson that you've learned about yourself or others or teaching um, that you think is cool through this journey, you know, your, your whole life? What's something interesting that you'd like to, a life lesson that stands out? Oh boy. Um, I know that's a tough one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Might well, not be I, a good rapid fire question. I am definitely testing stuff still. Yeah, that's okay. I think um, cultivating curiosity mm. in all things, remaining open to, you know, having your mind changed and just not not ever being fixed, you know, being strong in your, your beliefs and clear in who you are, but being open and curious to what else is out there and not being afraid of that. Awesome. All right. And then final one, how can people connect to you if they're interested in learning more? They go to momentumlearning.info and they join our email list. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, that would be the easiest way. And then from there, you know, we, you know, they'll have other ways to contact and, you know, see if they want to work with us directly, but yeah, but through there, they can find out about, you know, like I'm loving the, the integrated entrepreneur community uh, gatherings that we do once a month, you know, well, twice a month, because the different times. Um, I'm really excited for the academy that we're going to be starting. So, but yeah, so joining that email list is the simplest thing because then they'll get updates as we continue to do super cool, awesome stuff. Yes. Yeah. And as the person that built that website, um, your bio is also on there and it has links to your social, uh, your, you know, your LinkedIn and your Facebook, um, or they can also learn more about you. So momentumlearning.info slash Ken. Yeah. So oh, cool. Cool. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you very much uh, for your time today. This has been spectacular. It was, a, I think, a very successful practice run. Um, yeah, and for all the listeners, you can look forward to more in the future. So do you have any any parting thoughts before we sign off? Uh, yeah, just remember the whole idea behind dropping pebbles and making ripples is you're holding a contribution right now, and it's just let it go. You know, just release it on the world. We all need you. And, and your value. So uh, go out there and make some ripples. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ken. And as yeah. always, keep, keep being you. Bye-bye. <laughs>